Welcome to another episode of Monday, Monday Afternoon, afternoon Theologian. Recording in progress. There she is again, annoying nasal girl. <laughs> is that something that enough people are familiar with, you think, that we aren't just sounding like total idiots? <laughs> I'm pretty sure everyone has noticed that um, this particular voice is is not the most pleasing when opening a Zoom chat. <laughs> right. Oh, it has to do with opening a Zoom chat? You thought it was just someone there in the room with you? <laughs> yeah, I thought it was a fan club member back there. But... <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> oh. I uh, wondered if perhaps some people just had the idea that we had a lot of allergies and that we just sound that way when we're allergic to stuff. You know, maybe we're allergic to an annoying nasal girl. <laughs> that could be. We could get into an endless loop with that somehow. Just keeps going and going. Oh, man. We do yeah. a fractal spiral. And the next thing we know, we're very, very tiny. That'd be cool. I think, isn't there a, uh, a specific thing in nature, Fibonacci's? something yeah really. the Fibonacci progression will will get you there yeah that'd be cool so we can just assume that this is a part of the Fibonacci progression in resulting in annoying nasal girl I think we've there we go. That. We'll we'll just blame it on some old dead Italian guy <laughs> <laughs> okay okay <laughs> not just, like he's going to be able to object to anything <laughs> Won't we be surprised if he does? <laughs> <laughs> I object. You get a nasty email signed Fibonacci. <laughs> <laughs> or if he's Italian, I object. <laughs> Why do we get off on these tangents? <clears throat> because we can. <laughs> we get annoying in our tangential banter. <laughs> All right. Well, here we are back again. I'm trying to just bring myself right back into the moment so that we can actually get started on this episode because we are back again with season three and we are at episode two and because we are talking about character qualities and the first character quality was the character quality of love the second one in our list would be joy that's where we're headed today sounds good because i like to be joyful who doesn't but before we get there, since we're going to reference a, a volume that is near and dear to both of us, mm -hmm. a book called At the Heart of Every Great Father, mm -hmm. I'm going to make a shameless plug for that book, which can be found on Amazon or on our new website. There's a link to the Amazon purchase point, and I'm sure that uh, you're going to put across the bottom all of the words that make up our new website, which is Monday afternoon theologians dot podia, P O D I A, which is the hosting site dot com. Monday afternoon theologians dot podia dot com, because there will be linked to your books, all three of them. Soon there will be another volume that is a fictional account of some of the things that are happening in the world today and how as Christians we can use our spiritual superpowers to help overcome those things. Shameless plug for your book, the upcoming book, and the website. You didn't actually mention who the author of this upcoming fiction is. Well, I have to rack my memory to see who might have authored that volume. It's the guy on the <laughs> other side of the screen. <laughs> Rick is the author. Yeah, we're doing a final edit, then it'll be available here before too long. But before we get into all of that, we need to get back into joy. And I'm pretty sure that there's some illustrations that can be found in At the Heart of Every Great Father that might actually point us to some of those joyful things that we can find in life. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And thank you for your shameless plug. <laughs> and thank you for suggesting back uh, when we were visiting together in person about using some of the stories from At the Heart because I had completely forgotten about it. It was sitting on a shelf. And it's kind of nice for me to have revisited that because it brought me back to a time when my kids were all pretty little and I was learning things from them. And I learned a few things about joy 
looking at the stories that I wrote back when my kids were little, I discovered how companionship factors into being joyful. There was something about the relational aspect between a father and his kids doing things together to build that relationship, which resulted in pure joy. And I was kicked all the way back into a memory when I was a little kid and my dad was watching me because my mom had gone out to a meeting or shopping or something. And dad was pretty busy. He was probably studying to preach because he did that a lot, especially on Friday nights and Saturday nights. I really wanted to play. And I think he realized that if he was going to have any time at all with his son, he was going to have to carve out some of that time. So he came into the living room and he said, you want to play a little balloon volleyball? And I thought that was a big deal because for one thing, my mom would probably be annoyed <laughs> that we were playing with a balloon and playing volleyball in the living room where there were things like lamps that can get knocked over. He strung a string between two objects in the living room and made a net of sorts. And we got the balloon and we were slamming that thing around and we just roared with laughter. It was a great time. And I'm sure that he probably had to confess to my mother that we had done that together. But I just remember having an evening with him as a younger boy thinking, this is really joyful. This is really great. I didn't use that term. I was probably just thinking, I'm really happy. <laughs> but it was a, a relational companionship kind of thing. That also brought another memory, which I wrote about in the book. When my son was young enough, I think he was probably five or six we had to try to catch a raccoon that was sneaking into our garage at night and getting into our garbage can. And so we slept in the loft above the garage floor and we had a flashlight and we had some snacks and he fell asleep long before I did. And then I was just drifting off to sleep and I heard the garage door going. And this little raccoon was pulling the door enough until it could finally get it swinging because it was a pretty heavy door. And it was the old fashioned kind that just had one big door that would go. And he whipped it up enough so he could slide in there. And so I shined the flashlight down on him and he looked like a little burglar who was caught. <laughs> he just looked like I didn't expect to see you up there. And I did what every good uh, brave dad did. I said, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I threw the pillow down at him or something like that. And he scampered out the door and the door probably hit him in the tail on the way out. And my son woke up and asked, what's going on? I said, we caught him. So that was a joyful time because it was companionship. It was doing the little things together, but it was just hanging out with somebody that we enjoyed being with. So that was a part of what was shaping my life at that part of my fatherhood uh, experience when I was a younger dad. And those are the things that started getting me thinking a little bit about, well, what is it that creates joy for us? I think we can probably look at that a little more in detail today. Yeah, I've discovered as a, uh, a dad playing balloon volleyball that a high vaulted ceiling is a lot more fun than a low popcorn ceiling. <laughs> popcorn ceilings tend to go through a lot more balloon volleyballs than a nice high vaulted ceiling that you can mm -hmm. really get some height on. And our kids were gone by the time we had visitors in our garage not too long ago, but ours wasn't a raccoon. It was a bear. So no. One of us had failed to close the garage door, <laughs> and I woke up hearing the dog going crazy down by the door that, that comes into the house. Oh, man. She was barking up a storm. I held on to her collar, opened the door just a little bit. She was still barking. And the bear ran out, but it was pretty obvious that he'd been in the trash can and there was, you know, it was kind of askew and the top was up. And the next morning there were uh, what used to be bags of trash now spread across a very large part of the front yard. Oh, man. Uh, so we collected all of the individual pieces and put it back in the can. And then we're very careful to make sure that that door was closed. They're, uh, <laughs> they're, they're just hungry all the time when it's time to go hybrid. Yes. And I'm sure that they are hungry for companionship too, and wish that you would have sat down and had a good snack with them. <laughs> yeah. They, uh, one of them poked his nose in the window one night after I had made some spaghetti and kind of went, hmm, that smells good. But uh, he wandered off later. So that's no big <laughs> That is remarkable. Well, no, it's no wonder that the first time we got to visit you in Colorado and we said, can we leave the window open downstairs just a couple of inches? And you said, no, we wouldn't recommend that. 
because at that time, before you had some work done on your house and that level down below that window was close enough that a bear could have actually gotten into that window. Yeah, now that we've had the, the backyard regraded into a way that slopes the water away from the house, mm. there's plenty of room there, uh, plenty of height so that even a good size bear would not be able to get his little paws up on that windowsill and pull himself in because they're remarkably strong. I would guess so. Crazy. <laughs> Whoa. So we talked about one element of joy, which is the companionship that we have with people that we care about. Mm -hmm. There's a thread, of course, that's going through our first few episodes here. And that, of course, is that passage out of Galatians 5. So why don't you give us a little insight on that as we start to look at the various places where we see joy in the scriptures? Mm, good idea. I realized how skewed I was in one particular direction back at that time of my life. Now that I've lived a few more years beyond that stage of life, I can see how I need to expand my definition of joy. And it's really helpful to look at a, a lot of these different scripture passages. We've just chosen a small handful, but there are a number of them in there. <clears throat> if I were to type in the word joy in my BibleGateway.com search area, there would be, I think, about 333 references to the word joy in Scripture. So it's plentiful. And we're not going to do them all, right? Because that not. would take hours and hours. It would. We're only going to do 300 of them. Just round Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> that would be about uh, half a second each, and we'll be done with this episode. Sure. But joy is number two on that list in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. So let me just read that passage, because that's where we're getting these character qualities in this segment of season three. And it says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then I love what he puts at the very end of that. There is no law against these things, which I, that's something we could unpack. That would be a message in itself. There is no law against these things. If you're doing these kinds of things, if this is the character growing out of your life, nobody can fault you for that. And you're not breaking any of God's laws by doing them, which means that this is probably the spirit that transcends the law. It fulfills it and even goes above it. Paul talks about the law here because uh, he was schooled in the law. I mean, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I mean, he, he had it down. He knew all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And yet... He also knew that Christ had fulfilled the law, so the law was not an overarching set of rules anymore for the believers, but yet he still goes back to that. He still references that because it was a part of their culture, it was a part of their society to know and understand what God's law was. And he's saying that, as you just said, that if you do this, there's not going to be any problems. You're not going to be violating God's law. You're, you're going to be in good standing. And uh, I, I think that was an encouragement to those, who, and still to us today, that uh, mm -hmm. it's an encouragement that these are things that we should have in our lives um, because they're good for others, they're good for ourselves, and it's showing that we are in tune with the Holy Spirit, which is something we want to be every day. Yeah, no kidding. It means <laughs> that we are actually putting on the kinds of character qualities that Jesus has and had which means that that transformation is taking place. And that's good because that's what we see as our end goal. We as believers, we as followers of Jesus, allowing his Holy Spirit to produce all this fruit in our lives so that people see an awful lot of Jesus in us. That's what I would hope for. Right. It's something that we would want to strive for all the time. And yet we also see that the concept of joy goes back into the, uh, the Old Testament. There's references there. We'll take a look at one in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that as humans, joy is a part of our makeup. It's something that we want to experience. We certainly wouldn't want to be at the height of joyfulness every second of every day because we don't have enough adrenaline to keep us there. <laughs> but, <laughs> True. <laughs> but we also see, let's take a look at a passage in uh, 1 Samuel. It's in chapter 4, and it says, When all the Israelites saw the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord coming into the camp, their shout of joy was so loud, it made the ground shake. 
in the Ark of the Covenant was a big deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a symbol. It was a tangible item that showed the Israelites that the covenant with God was real. Yeah. You know, had yeah. some items inside of it with historical significance. And yet it also was an element that they used when they went into battle, because it was said that if you had the Ark of the Covenant when you went into battle, God was with you and no army could stand against you. And we learned all about that in Raiders of the Lost Ark, but that's a whole nother story. We did. So it was a very significant emblem of the covenant with God that said, we are the chosen people of God. And they shouted with joy at the mere sign of it. There's something about them being aware that they were in God's presence and that where he is, there is power. And so for them, that was a joyful thing because it's like, hey, we're in God's presence. He's on our side. And we're joyful about it. And we're joyful about it. Yeah. I mean, why wouldn't we be? I mean, we're, we know that and now that as believers in Christ, that God is on our side. God is with us. And mm -hmm. therefore, we are joyful about that on a daily basis. Yeah. And we're joyful because we know because of what Jesus Christ did for us, that we don't have to have a tangible symbol to represent God anymore because we are the temple of God. He dwells within us, not just in a tabernacle or in an Ark of the Covenant. That covenant was made pure by Jesus who fulfilled the law and who fulfilled all of the Old Testament prophecies about what that Messiah was going to be doing. And then he made it very, very clear that all the believers carry him around with them in their hearts, carrying Jesus around inside us. We can be filled with joy at any time because his spirit can bubble up and bubble over with the joy uh, of his presence in our lives, too. And the other part of that that I see is that if we had that tangible symbol, you know, if we had all your little uh, Ark of the Covenant sitting on our desk, it would be easy to make that an idol. Yeah. And we wouldn't want that because we want to put all, all other gods aside and worship the one true God who lives within us. Uh, and you say, we, we have him within us. The spirit dwells within us. What bubbles up out of us are those characteristics that we see in Galatians 5, one of which is joy. That's a strong indication that the living God is part of our lives and does dwell within us. Right. Yeah, no kidding. And I've noticed that the people who kind of embody that sort of joy, that long-lasting, non-circumstantial joy, are the people who are not just always faking joy. They're not just so pseudo-happy, and they're not just syrupy sweet all the time. Theirs is just a real, genuine joyfulness and yet they still can feel other feelings as well. They're well-balanced individuals. So we're not talking about a syrupy sweet, putting it up over the top to say, we always have to be joyful about everything. Because sometimes there are times when we're going to be down in the mouth. Sometimes we're just going to have a Monday that feels like a Monday. <laughs> All that stuff is true, but it's a genuineness, an authenticity of that kind of joy that just seems to bubble over more often in the people that I see who have been walking with Christ on a regular basis for years, it's just real with them. And it comes across as being very authentic. And when we have experienced that ourselves, it's easy to see when it's not genuine. And you just go, mm, yeah, I'm not buying it. Right. Yeah. Not that we're judging them. But, no, um, but sometimes that's a facade. And sometimes they need to be asked a few good probing questions to say, what's really going on in your life right now? because they're just covering over some stuff that needs to be dealt with. What's next on our list? Yeah, that's where we're headed. Um, Psalm 1611, which says, you will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. So who do you think the psalmist is talking about there? <laughs> hmm, who could it be? I think maybe he's talking about God. I would think he probably was. I think so. God is the one who's showing the psalmist the way of life, granting him the joy of God's presence and the pleasures, the authentic pleasure of just living in God's presence forever. And that's a promise that we see way back in Scripture, and it's continually held before us, held out in front of us as something that we as believers get to look forward to. You know, we look at that, that first phrase, the way of life. Everyone that I, I've ever known and talked to in, in depth has somewhere along the way asked the question, what is the meaning of life? Mm -hmm. 
You know, we want to know what our purpose is. And here he says, this is the way of life. Yeah. God will show it to you. And once you're in a right relationship, then you have the joy of his presence all the time and knowing with certainty that we will have a forever with him. Yeah. All of that is true, both in this life and then in the eternity to come. You're exactly right. Uh, what's another one? I, I think we had thrown another one out onto our list from the psalmists. Yeah, this one comes from Psalm 40, and it says, But may all who search for you be filled with joy and gladness in you. May those who love your salvation repeatedly shout, The Lord is great. You almost can't help but shout, The Lord is great, when you have the joy of knowing him when you know that he loves you, when I know that he loves me, I mean, we are filled with joy. We are filled with gladness. Mm -hmm. And we know that his love endures forever. I mean, it says God is love, and God demonstrated his love for us. He is great, and, and we can't help but shout it. Yeah, and I love this part about may all who search for you, because the scriptures also tell us that if we're searching for him, if we really seek after him, he will be found. So we know that he is findable, and he's not some nebulous behind-the-cloud God who is the unknowable, but it's somebody who's wanting to be found, and he wants to be known because he wants companionship with his created beings. And so, yeah, we can search for him and know that we can find that same joy and gladness in his presence. Yeah, our, our next scripture also talks about that, and it goes from the poetry section that we find in the Psalms to the very practical section that we find in Proverbs. It says, joyful is the person who finds wisdom, the one who gains understanding. And that does sound practical, because it sounds like once we have found God, we're also going to be finding his wisdom, because he's going to give that to us, because wisdom, which is pure and undefiled, comes from above. He's the father of lights. He's the giver of good gifts. He's the one who can give us the way of life, which includes his wisdom which means that it's not just intellectual prowess, but it's making right decisions about what we do know. So you can be the most intellectual person in the world and not be wise, especially if you're ignoring the God who provides wisdom for us. I mean, the, the Bible says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Mm -hmm. But the, the beginning of, of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And once we understand that, once we gain that understanding, then we can move forward into a right relationship because we understand who he is. He has made the way for us to find him, as you said. And once we seek, we're going to find him. And if we seek more, we'll find more. If we search more, we'll find a, a greater depth to our understanding and our wisdom. Yeah. And I see this kind of progressive sanctification happening there too, because there's that justification, a term that we've thrown out early in some of our episodes that we're justified by him and what he's done for us. And so there's that initial joy of knowing that we've been forgiven of all of our sin. So there's the freedom from guilt and shame, which is a terrific reason for joy. I mean, we're joy filled. But then once we found him, then we start to gain this wisdom, which helps us with really understanding how to make right choices. And that keeps us from having to stray into those things that cause us so much pain. And so there's a deeper level of joy that comes as we're sanctified, as we're starting to be transformed. And we still have that affirmation coming every time we make a right decision, because we have God living within us through the Holy Spirit. And he'll affirm all those good decisions, which helps us understand that wisdom is the right way of life. So there's many more places in the Old Testament that talks about joy. We've just touched on a few of them. But why don't we move into the Gospels? Good plan. All right. This one's out of Mark, Mark 1. It's very early in, uh, in his writings. Mm -hmm. and a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. Hmm. I wonder who's making that statement <laughs> since it's coming from heaven. <laughs> kind of sounds like God the Father. And, and what an authentication that Jesus is the true Son of the Father, the true mm -hmm. Son of God, is when he speaks in a voice that can be heard by humans and says, this is my beloved Son, mm -hmm. and he brings me great joy. Yeah, that's a big affirmation. I got to preach on that just yesterday because I'm starting a study in the book of Mark, and we talked about that 
inauguration of Jesus' earthly ministry when he was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan. That's when this takes place. And we see all three of the triune personhoods, the triune God is present at this momentous occasion because we've got God the Father in heaven who speaks. We've got the Holy Spirit who comes in the form of a dove or like a dove and rests on Jesus. And then you've got Jesus himself, God the Son. So all three are present at that moment as God inaugurates everything that Jesus is going to be doing for the next three years, culminating in his death, burial, and resurrection. And he really affirms that. It was like his uh, laying on of hands through the dove, so to speak, and his speaking wonderful words over that son, saying, yes, you're my beloved son. You bring me great joy. I delight in you. What a great affirmation. Well, and it also talks about characteristics of God. We are made in his image. He is joyful. Mm -hmm. We, therefore, can be joyful as well. And we should be joyful over the same types of things. Yeah, no kidding. And we are. And I find that as I pour myself out in different things that he's gifted me to do, as I'm doing those things, I feel his pleasure. I sense his smile. It's kind of like Eric Little who ran. He says, yes, God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And so when <laughs> I run, I feel his pleasure. And I love that because when he won, he won for God's glory, not for his own glory. And we feel God's pleasure when we're doing the things that he has gifted us to do. We see that in the next verse that we'll take a look at and how we know he is joyful and we know that we are also joyful when something like this happens. Mm -hmm. There is no more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. I mean, we rejoice when someone comes to know Christ in a, in a very personal way. When someone accepts that salvation that's freely offered to them, we rejoice greatly. We have great joy for them. And we see that all of heaven rejoices in that as well, mm -hmm. because that is the greatest purpose for a, a human being is to be reestablished in a right relationship with a loving father who has wanted it from their very conception. That seems to be really top on the joy list as we look through all these things. And it seems to give us a glimpse into God's heart because he loves lost people coming into a right relationship with him. That's what he desires most of all. He would love to see everybody return to him because he wants to give them that which will give them the greatest pleasure for the longest period of time. And Jesus even spoke about that a number of times in the parables. God would seek after us with everything he has mm -hmm. to bring us back to him. Yep. We are of such value that he would and has gone to the ends of the earth, has made the ultimate sacrifice if it was only one of us. Mm -hmm. But if it was only one, Christ still would have come and died. He still would have been on the cross. He still would have shed his blood to cover the sins of the one. And he really keeps seeking. He really wants to draw people so that they can get to that point where they will make that personal decision to trust him. That's, that's his ultimate desire. He would love that more than anything else. And it, it's neat for me to think about angels partying in heaven every time some lost sinner comes home and says, yeah, I get it. I need the Lord. I'm going to start following Jesus. And then they just start whooping it up. <laughs> There's a, in another of my not yet finished uh, Christian novels, there's a scene where a human gets to see the party that's going on for him because of the decision that he made. Is there a, is, another scripture or two that we want to chat about? There is. There's another good one, but I want to put a parenthetical note in there to say that you, fellow theologians, are not going to want to miss Rick's book when it comes out, because I've been reading it as he's been pitching stuff to me. <laughs> And there's so many intriguing things. And it is a fiction, and he's very clear about that. But it's fun for us to suspend uh, some of the things that we might normally think about and to think, oh, but what, what would it be like if we were given privileged information like that and we can actually see it? it I love how he personifies some of this stuff. So you're going to want to see that. I think it's going to really ignite your imagination. And it's all biblically based. So how can you go wrong with that? So anyway, <laughs> yes, there's another one here that, lets me know that sometimes we feel 
really despondent because we feel like we're distanced from God. And there was a very real time in real history when some of the disciples felt that way because they really didn't know that Jesus was going to be rising from the dead, even though he told them about it. <laughs> he really had told them a couple of different times with his disciples, I'm going to be mistreated, I'm going to be beaten, I'm going to be killed, I'm going to die, but don't worry because I'm going to come back. It's going to be all right. And they're thinking, okay, this is beyond our comprehension there. But it says, as he spoke, he showed them, the disciples, the wounds in his hands and his side, and they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord, because that's when all of his words came flooding back to them, and they realized, oh, that's what he was talking about. He did come back to life. He's real, and he's standing right before us, and we get it because we're watching it. We're seeing him empirically with our own eyes. We're hearing him with our own ears. We're touching him with our own hands. He is real. He's alive. That's interesting to see, and I don't know that I would have been any different than those, those first disciples. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I would have gotten it to the level that I said, oh, okay, well, we'll, we'll throw him in the tomb for a little while, and then he'll come back out. Right. Um, you know, it's like they didn't really understand. They didn't get it. Were they thinking, what, is he playing hide and seek for three days, and we just haven't found him? Uh, no, when he comes out and we can see where he was pierced, we can see the nail holes in his uh, in his wrist or his hand, depending on what you believe as far as how the crucifixion was done. Mm -hmm. uh, they went, oh, yeah, he was dead, and now he's alive again. And help but be joyful, because this is the most important person that I have ever met and will ever meet. Mm -hmm. No wonder that the word joy is used so often in association with that specific event because that's what makes all the other real joy possible. And of course, they were the most joyful when they realized, ha, he really did what he said he was going to do, and he's alive. And that brings us to the reason why he was killed and died and stayed in the tomb and then came back to life again. And that is because he was able to forgive people of their sin. What does Romans 4, 8 say? It says, yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. There are so many places where we see Christ in action, talking to a, a paralyzed man or a blind man or a, a woman who had had an affliction for years and years and years, mm -hmm. and he releases his power and he authenticates his lordship when he says and then uh, conclusively does forgive the sin of a human who needs it so desperately. And that was actually before the fact that he shed his blood. So he was taking care of that for them, knowing that he was going to go to the cross. He was going to be crucified. He was going to die. Uh, he was going to be pierced with the sword. His blood was going to be sacrificed. It was going to be shed and poured out on the ground, at which point all of the sin that he had taken on uh, when his father turned his back on him and said, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mm -hmm. All of that coming together when the blood is shed and it covers every sin that has ever been, and all we have to do is accept it. And once we do, all of that guilt is taken away. Yeah. And the natural response to that is woohoo. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, what a burden to be lifted and to know that it will never be held against us. God can't even remember it. It is far as the east is from the west, which is a metaphor that says it is as far away as possible. And mm -hmm. it is now no longer in the equation. God sees us robed in Jesus' righteousness, which is perfect and has no blemish whatsoever. Yeah. And our reaction, of course, is joy. Yeah, it's incredible. Like Simon Peter, who had denied Christ three times, and yet when he sees Christ again after the resurrection, Jesus forgives him and reinstates him. You can't help but be joyful. That's why he preached so incredibly after that, because he was a believer, and he knew about that joy, and he wanted desperately for so many other people to have that same kind of joy by being forgiven and have their record cleared of all sin. And that, of course, is the purpose that we have, is to make that story known, mm -hmm. to uh, allow others to understand what we've known for so long, Yeah, and how important it is for us simply to accept what has been done on our behalf. Mm -hmm. And for some, that's very difficult. There's something, and maybe it's a 
disguised pride in all of us. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but maybe it's just the blindness of sin, but it's hard for us to understand that somebody would be that gracious. We just don't comprehend grace. It's like we need to balance the scales somehow, and we think we would have to earn that. There's just such a strong thing in all of us that feels like if somebody gives me something, I've got to give something back in return. Otherwise, it's unfair. Well, uh, grace is not terribly fair. It wasn't fair for Christ, but he gave himself because of love for us. And because he was so pure in his love, he gave all of himself, even unto death on our behalf, so that we could be free from that sin. And all we have to do, like you're saying, is just accept it, even though we don't understand it. We just have to accept it. Which, in essence, is pretty easy to do if we will put aside our pride, if we'll put aside our own concepts of fairness, mm -hmm. of, of, as you say, balancing the scales. The Bible tells us that everything that we think we have done that is good is as if it's mm -hmm. filthy rags. Yeah. It's not worth anything. Right. Because Christ did it all. Yeah. That's what balances the scale. Christ's blood balances every sin that ever was. And I'm going to say, okay, I will let your shed blood cover my sin and be thankful that you did that, even though, as we saw in the garden, he didn't want to. Mm -hmm. you know, he asked if there was another way because he knew how painful that was going to be. And yet he also knew that, um, as, as Paul describes, uh, a whole different scenario. It's a momentary light affliction, mm -hmm. but it was going to hurt. Yeah. You know, flogging with the tools that the Romans did, uh, mm -hmm. what they said was nobody could withstand 40 lashes, yeah. Um, yeah. which is why they only did 39. It's, it was going to hurt. And then he knew what going to the cross was actually going to mean. He knew that he was going to die, and yet he had the assurance that God the Father was going to bring him back because that was plan A from the very beginning. Before the garden, before the fall, that plan had been mapped out very, very early, mm -hmm. and um, it didn't mean he wanted to go through it, and yet he but did. he did, yeah. and all of those things that he foretold came forth, and now we can benefit from it in ways that we can't even imagine at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can't understand it fully. I'm sure yeah. glad he did it. Just thinking about it brings me joy. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. Let me think about recapping just a few of these sub themes that we saw as we skimmed the rock across the top of the surface of the water related to these verses that we've looked at today. Uh, let's tackle this one right off the bat. Joy in God's presence. Well, especially for those who finally understand that their sins have been forgiven as we accept that which we just talked about. Mm -hmm. I mean, that first time acceptance creates joy for the sinner who has now been saved, for the yeah. one who has introduced the sinner to Jesus yeah. and all of heaven. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're rejoicing that the lost sinner, the, the one of the hundred has been found and has been returned to a right relationship with, with God. Yeah. I mean, that can't help but be a joyful experience for everybody involved. Yeah, biggie, a biggie. I mean, I remember my personal situation. I made my profession privately after a friend had, had helped me understand everything that was going on. And yet there were a ton of people behind the scenes who had been praying for me for a long time. And every one of them was joyful. They all played a part in uh, my repentance and the forgiveness that I was able to receive. I mean, they were all very, very happy for uh, what happened in my life. And I have seen it a number of times myself and am always rejoicing when uh, a sinner repents and finds mm -hmm. Jesus for the first time. Mm -hmm. It is a big deal for sure. Uh, what's another sub point that we kind of grabbed as we were looking through these verses together? Well, there's joy when someone returns to God after a season. It's not uncommon. In fact, yeah. it's probably normal for particularly new believers to kind of waver back and forth. Oh, yeah. You know, they kind of, they've got old friends, old culture, old society, old uh, mm. social uh, stigmas that are part of their life. And so they kind of waver back and forth a little bit. 
And so for a season, they're in the spirit, for a season, they're in the world. But when we come back, it always feels better. Yeah. And then as we walk through our Christian life, eventually we find that we're in his presence more and more, and the wavering becomes almost non-existent. Yeah, good point. That's true. As you were speaking, I thought about a woman that I got to meet about two months ago. It was just a couple of weeks before we actually started our road trip and went out to visit you guys. She showed up in our one of our first in-person services that we had as we started to make our way back into in-person worship. And she was a friend of a coworker who attends our church. And she thanked me for allowing her to come back to church because she had felt so distant because she hadn't been in church for a long time. And I said, oh my goodness, you're thanking me for allowing you to come back. I said, I thank you for showing up because you don't know what an encouragement it is to all of us because we've been praying for you. And tears got into her eyes because she realized, oh, there's, there's a collective thing going on here. There's a community involved. So yeah, you're right. We experienced joy in seeing her coming back into God's presence again after she'd been away for a very long time. It's a beautiful thing. One of the other things you touched on was, was God's affirmation. Why don't you mm -hmm. take a minute and, and talk a little more about that? Yeah, we see that exemplified right off the bat when John the Baptist baptizes Jesus and God affirms Jesus. It happens again on the Mount of Transfiguration. We hear God speak again there where he says very much the same thing. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. In other words, listen to him. <laughs> He's got it right. You need to follow him. But we also sense God's smile when we're doing something that he's gifted us to do, particularly when that gift results in somebody else coming to faith in Christ, because there's this collective evangelism, this collective good news sharing that happens when we're a member of the body of Christ, and it takes the whole body to do it well. So even though my part may feel very small and insignificant, when anybody comes to faith in Christ, we feel God's affirmation because he says, see, you're part of the body too, and you are a part of that. And so now not only are the angels rejoicing, but all of you are rejoicing as well. It's a wonderful thing to feel God's affirmation and to sense his smile. A thought came to mind as you were talking about that. We play a little part in hundreds, if not thousands of stories. Yeah. And I remember one in particular um, was back when we were in college. It was in that trip where we first met. And one of the folks there mentioned to me, he said, uh, I'd like to talk to you about your faith in Christ because you're one of the only ones that I see where it makes sense, mm. which I thought was very encouraging, but but kind of sad. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't seem to make sense in the lives of others. Um, that was about the only part I played in that. And I heard that sometime mm. later, a matter of weeks later, he did come to faith in Christ well before we even had a chance to talk about it. So God was working on his heart. I got to play a little tiny part in that. Mm -hmm. but I was affirmed in what I was doing. He was affirmed in being drawn back. And mm -hmm. for both of us, that affirmation from God was complete. It was total yeah. because of all of the things that come together when a mm -hmm. sinner repents and comes to salvation. It's a wonderful thing. It's amazing how we can still find ourselves back in that same joyful situation by just thinking about it for a second, even though it might've been years since that crossed our minds. God takes us instantly back into that moment. And once again, we get to vicariously feel that same joy. <laughs> and uh, gee, what if that became addictive and we wanted to feel that again, and uh, it motivated us to share the gospel uh, more effectively and more consistently so that we could have new stories in which we can have joy as well. That sounds like a real New Testament concept. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> Sounds like something we ought to be doing together, which brings us to the next subcategory that we sort of had grow out of these verses, which is there's joy in being in the presence of other believers who share his joy. Well, and especially after the lockdowns or the lockouts or the lockups or everything that has gone on over the past couple of years, yes. where it was difficult for our communities to be together and doing those things that make us a community, that bring us closer together. Yeah. And yet, when we get back together, the joy is right there. Yeah. Because we love each other, because we like each other, because we want to be 
experiencing what we do together in the church to uh, learn more about what's been happening with them and their families and to share those joys and the heartbreaks and all of those things that we may not have been aware of because we haven't been able to be close. It uh, gives us an appreciation for being that uh, part of that, that body of believers that meets locally and has a chance to impact their community. Mm -hmm. No kidding. We're just now starting to really feel like we're a little more normal again in our worship practices. And that's just begun feeling that way in the last few weeks. And there is something really joyful about being in the presence of other believers that way. And we tend to encourage one another in that joy and to encourage one another to continue to give ourselves away to others the way God intends for us to, because he's gifted us to give ourselves away so that other people can see Christ and be drawn to him. And it is a joyful experience. And it has been heightened because we were apart from that and just doing virtual services for so long and they kept us physically distanced. I like what a friend of ours, which we visited on our road trip said, she says, I'm such a literalist that I can't use the term socially distant. That doesn't work for me. I can be 10 feet apart from you and I'm still going to be social. <laughs> she says, physically distant. Now that I can accept. Yes, I will be physically distant, but I'm never going to stop being social. <laughs> Good way to look at it. It is. And we've so, been physically distanced, many of us, but fortunately for us, now we're able to start being socially together, including being closer, even physically. So is there another point of recap here before we finish up? Yes. And this is the one that results in that party in heaven. And it's that there is joy in seeing somebody who has been far from God being drawn near to him, especially using the biblical terminology, when one lost sinner comes back home, he or she is saved. When somebody is saved, which means that they have finally accepted the grace from God, and by faith, they have placed their life in his care, man, the angels go crazy with partying. And so do we as believers, fellow believers, because we're a part of all that happens with that. And it means that they've become a member of the family of faith the family of God, and we're all members of that together. So yeah, there's a tremendous amount of joy when that happens. I think you almost call that ultimate joy when we see somebody come yeah. to know Christ for the first time. You know, and, and these attributes don't work in a vacuum. No. So you know, love, joy, peace, all of those together. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was immediately reminded of what we talked about last week and the definition of love that I use, which is to seek to expect and to work towards the ultimate good in the life of another person. Mm -hmm. And what is that ultimate good is for someone to experience the reestablishment of a relationship with God through Christ. There's going to come a time when it's too late and they won't be able to do that. You know, you and I have talked a number of times that we would not be surprised if there was a great revival in the last days. Mm -hmm. You know, as that second coming gets closer, uh, we're going to feel that people are going to be searching and uh, struggling in life, and they're, they're not going to understand what's going on, and they're going to want to have answers to those ultimate questions that we'll be able to answer for them. So we need to be prepared, you know, emotionally, physically, spiritually, uh, mm -hmm. mentally, all the way around, so that we will be able to share that gospel in a way that makes mm -hmm. sense to them so that we can, again, experience that ultimate joy because of what happens in the life of that sinner. Yeah. And no matter what we might have been placing our faith in, whether it's politics or a political figure, anything that we've been placing our faith in, however true or not true it might be, there's really only one ultimate source of true joy, and that's Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate answer. And so when all these other things that we might have been placing our faith in start to fall short or drop off our radar and we think, oh, yeah, that didn't turn out the way I was thinking it was going to, then we can always come back to what we should have known, many of us, some may not have because they may not have grown up around all that, but there's a whole lot of folks that know enough about that to think, oh, yeah, I should probably get back to Jesus Christ, and I need to start reading those Gospels again in the Bible so I can get to know him better. Because he is the source of true joy, the only ultimate true source. Well, as we close here, I think it would be appropriate for us to uh, ask the Lord to bless our theologians with joy mm -hmm. and perhaps encourage those who haven't made that step to do so. 
How about if I lead us in a prayer that would kind of help somebody take those steps? Great idea. Okay, I'll do that. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you for being the source of joy. And I pray for somebody who might be listening right now who needs to take that step of faith and to place their life carefully into your hands, knowing that you are the source of joy and ultimate peace and comfort forever, and that they can just relax into your grace instead of trying to work hard to figure out what you are and who you are. They can just relax into you and that they can look into your word, read about you, get to know you better, especially through the gospels in the New Testament, where we see an awful lot of people reacting to Christ and he's the real deal. And so many people have proven that, not only by their lives of faith, but by the fact that they continue to bear fruit like these fruits of the Spirit that we're studying about right now. And I pray that you're going to just gift some of these people who are listening with real great joy, a sense of joy that bubbles over from within, knowing that their sins have been forgiven if they have trusted you, and I pray they will and that they can be a part of a family of faith so that they are together with a whole lot of other people who are sensing your affirmation and your sense of joy, and that they can be together in your presence, not only now, but eventually forever, because when these old bodies wear out, our souls will live on, and when our souls are in your presence and you renew this heaven and earth and restore everything to its perfection, those who are in you will enjoy that forever, and we're grateful for that. Thank you for all your promises. And thank you for what Jesus did for us on the cross to make it all possible. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I'm joyful that we were able to talk about joy. I am too. And uh, just by picking a few very selected scriptures that way, and knowing that there are 333 of them, it lets me know that this is an important subject. And I'm glad that God gives us an abundance of joy and a lot of places to look for it in scripture. So I'm pretty sure we're going to be back doing this next week, and I don't think we need a dartboard of destiny to say that our topic is probably going to be peace. I think you're right. Let's just go for it. (laughs) it. We can just be right up front about it. We're going to talk about peace next week. That's right. And we hope you'll join us next time for another episode of... Monday Monday Afternoon afternoon. Theologians. 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 Theologians.